but I've always been puzzled by this that I spent, you know, the first probably 43, 44 years of my life just taking for granted not only that it was the external world that is real and the <clears throat> internal world was just this kind of bewildering place where I never knew what was going on, you know, mm -hmm. my own experience. Mm -hmm. But that the world, I took it as a fundamentally just given that the world is made of multiple things. Right. And that, you know, no doubt comes from, you know, childhood development that we begin to discern the difference mm -hmm. between things <clears throat> for very good reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but as a part of this uh, process uh, of awakening beyond thought, one of the most crucial uh, aspects of it and sort of turns that in it in, in the path was realizing that no matter where I look, everything that I look at, everything that I encounter, it's actually all one thing. That there's no division that's really plausible that can be made between things. They so can say, well, you know, Gary's over there and you're over here. Yes, um, but let's track the, you know, gas particles of our carbon dioxide that we're breathing right. out and, the, right. and their oxygen that we're breathing in. Or let's uh, use some imaging techniques to look at the uh, um, infrared spectrum right. that where we are. And let's let's look at some imaging techniques to see what, about the microorganisms that are in, in our environment, that the perceived distinctions between us are, of course, just that. On one scale, they're real. Of course, you're going to go home, and mm. I'm going to go home, and we're going to carry out the aspects of the universe's work in our mm -hmm. own ways. Mm -hmm. But this feels very, in, felt like it was a very important part of my path where I just kind of smacked myself in the middle of the forehead and said, oh, well, I couldn't be separate if I wanted to. All right. Yeah, and you, we can take uh, many different approaches to that philosophically. I mean, just the fact that we are so massively interrelated uh, from course of our entire day nobody can stand alone anymore you cannot step outside of the stream of events in our lives it is we're so interconnected so from that standpoint we, we're not separable uh, to me and I had done a lot of some philosophical stuff on this not very much before I the page turned uh, and the big shift happened for me but then I saw it I mean I looked out and I thought oh this is what they're talking about it is all one thing I mean, it really is all one thing. It is, you can see it's all one energy. And it's all there because of your perceiving it. You can recognize the discreteness, as you mentioned, discreteness of objects. You can see the fact that they have different frequencies and different impact on your sensors. But in fact, it never leaves this knowing, this deep knowing that in fact it's all one thing. You know, philosophically up into, well, was it real or not real? Which is real? The point is, it constantly changes, which by most, by many definitions, is makes it unreal. It's changing, so it must not be real in, the, in that sense. But there's something clearly that stands apart from this, that is unchanging and still. And there's something that is out there that is all one thing and is constantly changing. And you can just, you can, it's a direct experience that there's no other way to talk about other than that, as much as we've tried to over the centuries to do it. But it is absolutely, uh, you can't miss it, and it doesn't leave. Even when you get pulled into what looks like believing that it is different, still you can feel underneath it. It's not real. This is all one thing. Well, I had read the philosophical tradition, you know, and, and been quizzed on it and so forth, and was never persuaded by it in the slightest. You know, I looked because I looked out on the world and I saw multiplicity. I saw distinctions between things, and I said, "Well, what are these people talking about?" And but it was more the experiential side yeah. that once I finally um, had uh, uh, moments where I experienced the fact that everything is one thing. And at first, I found it almost frightening because it would sort of manifest in instances of synchronicity mm -hmm. that had no business, you know, things that had no business being right. connected uh, to each other. But as I just sort of kept going and kept releasing that fear that I would experience, it became the most obvious thing in the world. You know, there's, uh, I think it's the Sufi writer, Titus Burkhardt, I like to um, quote his take on this, which is said, the, the unity of the world is the most obvious and obscure fact mm -hmm. 
an existence. It's a, it's obvious once you're willing to look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's obscure whenever we're busy dividing up the world into good and bad. I like this. I don't like that. I prefer that over this. Right. That one's good. That one isn't. Um, the, go ahead. The cognitive neuroscience totally supports this. But there's a great paper in 2010 in Neuron from, from Harvard. And they actually know, first of all, you guys are just deluded or something wrong with your brain. Well, in fact, <laughs> what happens is you actually know we have 11 centers that create this sense of there being something different from us I mean, and us in time. And you can, there's your two subnetworks or two core ones, and the other nine are in two subnetworks. One of the subnetworks, its function is to create the sense of you and something else. If that's not there, then there is no something else. There's just perception. And the same thing with you in time. Say, live it now, now, now. We live in now, now, now because the circuit that creates, you know, you, now, you, past, you, future, you, present, that's, you can, that can be quiet. If those two circuits are quiet, and if you do nondual meditation, what you'll do is you shut down the cores of that network, and so the network doesn't function uh, for these things. So it just follows logically, scientifically, naturally that, in fact, there can't be an other because the circuit that creates an other is not there. And so it's, you're seeing the true, real, which, in fact, there is only one thing. Right. So, in other words, the uh, the separation uh, motif and the past, present, future motif that we experience in ordinary reality is a special effect yeah. created by our, our minds right. that may have had some functional value in different evolutionary situations, right? right? That, right. you know, tiger's over there, right. I am over here, I will make calculations, right. or... Tiger was there before and acted this way, and, and I know how to act now. But th- it's just that, though. It's a special effect that is useful for some situations and is not an attribute of reality. No, the brain actually created that construct exactly. Darwinianly for some past, past time. And the question is, is it like useful now? I mean, you can see that the truth of it is that everything is all one thing. If you get that brain circuit out of the way, and we only exist now which is a cartoli, it only exists now. That's the other side of the circuit, us in time. They're just sides of this functionalizing circuit. Well, and it's becoming increasingly inescapable that we're all one planet. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll tell you a a funny story. Then people are starting to notice that even when, even beyond just the conceptual understanding, well, of course, you know, I can... If I can come up with the money and I want to squander the fossil fuels, I can go from here to Korea, for example. Mm. But an interesting symptom of it is that, you know, people have noted, but which uh, makes a nice little story, is I was at a a, a friend's 50th birthday party uh, the other night on Saturday night out in, you know, uh, about 30 miles in into central Pennsylvania mm. at a firehouse mm. in the middle of very rural area, right? Beautiful, very rural area. Um, you know, in many ways, very timeless, you know, it probably hasn't changed much there in the past 50 years. Um, and there was a DJ for this party for the, my friend's uh, 50th anniversary, you know, thing, playing uh, different songs. And all of a sudden this song came on that was K-pop, Korean pop Oh no! in this firehouse in, in central Pennsylvania in 2012 yeah. that, you know, where nothing has changed, and they're listening to this song, which happens to have gone viral mm-hmm. globally mm. from Korea. Oh yeah, because you can get it over YouTube. Right. Right. So the the the, the oneness principle is nothing other than what you know the computer scientist Ted Nelson called intertwingularity. He was one of the kind of like early pioneers, architects of uh, the idea of an internet. Mm-hmm. And he pointed out that, you know, we were going to become increasingly spatially interconnected. Mm -hmm. Now, the correlative of that is not just that we're interconnected, is that we were never separated in the first place. But it's so evident now. We can log on in, you know, milliseconds or seconds, certainly. And you can be connected to anybody on the planet. I can see, I Skyped last week with Singapore, Hong Kong, Germany. I was in Milan this morning. Yeah, Milan this morning, exactly. So, So, I mean, we're so interconnected. I mean, you can't step outside of that. So it's no, not surprising that we are now recognizing we all are one thing. Right. So that should be, we should start to take that and interpret that instead of saying, oh, well, you know, we're, this is globalization, you know, that, you know, that we're, that, that, that different powers are marching around the planet, making the planet into 
one thing is that the, it, what, what we're bringing out is the fact that the planet has always been right. one thing. Uh, and that it seems to me what will happen is, is that about 10 or 15 years ago, if you wanted to make an argument that technologies alter human culture, mm. it was a very controversial thing. Was, it, it, people say, oh, come on. Now it's just, it's just a tool. Yeah. You know, human beings decide how to use the tool. Right. And then that is just up to them. And it's like, well, then you go maybe 10 years later, and you're not going to be able to find anybody who will argue with you to say, well, the Internet hasn't changed human culture, mm. right? Of course, it's, it's a massive transformation. We're going to experience that. You know, we're, This is part of that experience of the transformation of human culture through the Internet. There are feedback loops between technologies and human culture. Now, there's no even you can't argue about it anymore. It seems to me we'll get to that point about oneness mm -hmm. in about five years, right? Yeah. That saying, well, yeah, I know, we used to argue that, you know, it was a worthwhile thing to divide up the planet into these different domains because that was a meaningful distinction to make. It's just not a meaningful distinction because it's part of a special effect we've produced in our brains. It's well, not real. Yeah, <laughs> and it's a cliche, but, but how powerful... Uh, the internet has been at breaking down the power of institutions. I mean, whether it's religions or countries or companies, I mean, the information is so ubiquitous, so freely, openly distributed in most countries that you can quickly know faster than your leaders know what's going on and be more effective at, you know, working in that situation. It's been, you know, first thing people do know is shut down the internet, you know, shut down Twitter, shut down Facebook. Because they can see the enormous power that that gives to the people and what a threat it is to the institutions. Well, institutions that make their living activating those parts of our brains which find distinctions between each other. That's right. And relegating our thoughts to past, present, right. and future. Um, one thing I would say, though, that's going to be interesting to see is that even as we are able to, uh, say, disrupt the power of institutions mm -hmm. uh, in the ways that we've seen in Arab Spring Right. and so on, right. uh, and to a lesser extent in this country, then the other side of it is to recognize the unity of all of us. Mm -hmm. Not just that, say, the people of Egypt can no longer be bamboozled in the same way by the institutional leadership of Egypt, but that we are all Egypt. Right. Right. Yeah. I think, too, the... Um, <clears throat> The idea of, of the physical reality of, of empathy that's been discovered through um, mirror neurons, mm -hmm. you know, going back to uh, neurobiology and those discoveries. I mean, to me, that's extremely fascinating and very powerful. You know, I've known we're all atoms for ages and that physical connection that we actually, you know, belong to the same substance and we share substance. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the fact that we, we do experience what others experience uh, physically in in our minds. So we can't observe. not experience what others experience. Right. So this empathy put on top of the, you know, the, the, the communication potential now that we're all interconnected, I think is really um, uh, expanding the effects. Well, and this, this idea of awakening beyond your own personal identity brings you into this sense of oneness. And out of oneness comes something that you know, real empathy, where, you know, I don't do a bad thing to you because you're me. And I can, I know that. And so they say, well, if you, if you lose this, you know, this little person back there, you'll become a bad person. Says, no, you become a good person because there's no reason to hurt anybody because everybody's you. So why would you behave any other way? And it's the golden rule. Almost every, every religion has something like that. But you get out of being who you are, and then you'll find a totally different energy arises. You're much more empathic because you're not with an agenda in there. And stuff just happens as it should be appropriately and very intelligently uh, manifesting. And there's a, there's, a, there's a trick and problem of language in there because sometimes people might hear that and they say, oh, well, you know, I, I'm treating Mark with compassion because Mark is me. It sounds like this narcissistic inflation hmm. of, of, of who I am. But I, I think if, we, if you just tried it, you would see that it isn't that. But everything's it, me. The cat's me. Yeah, I mean, yeah. e everything is me. So yeah, it isn't yeah. a question of just of, Mark. Just Mark. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, everything. Oh, the Mark special. He is Mark <laughs> special, yeah. But everything is, it's all one thing. Yeah. And so it's all one thing. Yeah. So how can you behave with any arrogance because 
you're not anything either. You can't find yourself. You look and you say, there's nothing in here that's me. So not do unto others as you would have them do unto you, but do unto others because you are doing unto you. Exactly. Yeah, that's a great, <laughs> that's a great rephrasing of that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great way to look at that. I think it really challenges the, um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, behavior science and, you know, science uh, game theory sort of thing, you know, kin selection, group selection. I mean, these things were debated. Uh, altruism. I mean, what does altruism mean if we really are physically connected with each exactly. other? Exactly. I mean, how do you do something that's selfish in that instance if, you, you know, when you, when you cause pain to her, she, you know, you feel that too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can come to ignore that. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a, a sociopath, how they, how they would, would right. you know, act in this situation. Right. Um, Absolutely. But, but you're right that it's, it's poorly mapped by the idea of altruism because altruism assumes that it, there is a self there who is then making some sort of a sacrifice, right. uh, according to one interpretation, or seeking some form of alternate gain. In, term, in terms of another interpretation. But either way, the basic principle is that there's no self there in the first place and that the experience of there being a distinct self is the thing that is to be overcome. We don't need to increase altruism. We need to decrease the sense of uh, distinction between ourselves. Right. And if we do that, the goal of altruism is achieved. Yeah, because if you look at <clears throat> a lot of, I'm not picking my philanthropist friends, but philanthropy, and if you really look at philanthropy very carefully, even in your own actions, when you think you're being philanthropic, you're doing it so you feel good. You aren't so much concerned about them. Watch very carefully. It's really, I'm going to feel good about this because I give this poor, poor person this thing. In fact, it's all about you. It really is your own feeling. That, to me, is not altruistic. That's really very self-serving. If you get out of the way, a whole other quality of giving manifests. That's very different. And again, to return to the Bible, the New Testament... Uh, and, uh, You're very biblical. I'm sorry. No, no, I uh, throw my beard out. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, the uh, something about the Bible makes you say you're sorry. <laughs> um, uh, First Corinthians 13 is Paul, and he's talking, and he says, you know, um, if I have the the tongue of men and angels, uh, and I have not charity, then I am nothing. But then he's very careful, and further down he says. If I have charity and it puffeth me up, yeah. then it basically it's not charity. Not charity. Um, so it's only this idea that if there's no self there in the first place, mm -hmm. then there really is no charity, mm -hmm. right? And if, and I believe that the um, translation is the, the term agape. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's there's no self there, or, or or is it maybe it's caritas? But in any event, it's a it's a love that is is there. Mm -hmm. that is a pure giving where there is nobody there to give.